Thank you for joining us for study 29 in Gladstream's online Bible school. Now we're actually at the last study of the first year of our course, well, 29 and 30, we're going to look at First and Second Peter and uh, there are 60 lessons in this study, these introductions to the Bible books. So you can pat yourself <clears throat> on the head and say, well, I've got through the first year once you've done this study and next week's study. So study 29, we're in First Peter. Uh, there are five chapters. There's uh, three chapters in Second Peter. So a uh, very easy reading over the next fortnight gives you time to catch up your, your other reading in previous weeks. First Peter, a highly authenticated book uh, written by the Apostle Peter and of course very important to us when we see his significance in the Gospels and uh, the special call that the Lord had in his life. So you want to know what he said and of course he's going to talk about holiness and he's going to talk about uh, the right way to live in the faith under persecution and thank Peter especially gets us to remember that the Lord is coming back and the days that we are living in it seems that the signs of the times are pointing the biblical prophecies are all around us say uh, what's been happening globally are pointing to a uh, something beyond the kings and the republics and the empires of this world we're looking for our redemption in Christ. So uh, a good study, take your time reading the, the chapters and we'll see you next week uh, for Second Peter. God bless you. The first letter of Peter. His name was Shimon or Simon when he first became a follower of Jesus and he was part of the inner circle of the 12 disciples. When he made his confession that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus changed his name to Kephas, which is Aramaic for rock, which was later translated into Greek as Petros or Peter. Jesus promised that he would become a leader among the apostles to guide the Messianic community in Jerusalem through its earliest years. And that's what happened. Remember the early chapters of the book of Acts. Eventually, Peter was called to carry the good news of Jesus beyond the borders of Israel, however, and this letter was written decades into that mission in the wider Roman world. We discover at the conclusion of this letter that Peter is in Rome, which he calls Babylon, and we learned that while Peter commissioned the letter, it was actually composed by a man named Silvanus, who was a co-worker of Peter. This was a circular letter sent to multiple church communities in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is in modern-day Turkey, and Peter learned that these mostly non-Jewish Christians were persecuted. They were facing hostility and harassment from their Greek and Roman neighbors. And so Peter wrote to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. And this helps explain the letter's design and its main themes. It opens with a greeting and then it moves into a poetic song of praise to God, which introduces the key themes that are explored in the main body of the letter, where he first affirms the new family identity of these persecuted Christians, which will help them see their suffering as a way to bear witness to Jesus. And this has a way of focusing their future hopes on the return of Jesus. Let's dive in. You'll just see how all the pieces work together. So Peter opens by greeting these churches as the chosen people of God who are exiled around the world. Now Peter makes clear throughout the letter that these Christians he's writing to are Gentiles. But here he describes them with phrases from the Old Testament that describe how God chose the people of Israel, the family of Abraham, who was himself an exile and wanderer. This is a key strategy that Peter repeats through the whole letter. He wants these suffering non-Jewish Christians to see that through Jesus they now belong to the family of Abraham. And so they're wandering exiles just like him, misunderstood, they're mistreated, and they're looking for their true home in the promised land. Peter continues this idea in the opening song. He praises God for causing people to be born again into a living hope through Jesus' resurrection and the power of the Spirit. God's inviting all people into a new family centered around Jesus, a family that has a new identity as God's beloved children and who have a new hope of a world reborn by God's love when Jesus returns as King. And for people who have have this hope, suffering and persecution is actually a strange gift because it burns
burns away false hopes and distractions like a purifying fire, and it reminds us of our true home and hope. And so paradoxically, life's hardships actually deepen our faith. They make it more genuine. From here, Peter's going to move on into the body of the letter, but he's going to explore all these ideas in greater depth. So he first develops the theme about the new family identity of God's people. He takes even more memorable Old Testament images about the family of Israel, and then he applies them to these Gentile Christians. So like the Israelites who left Egypt, they too are to gird up their loins and leave behind their former way of life on the way to a new future. So they are the holy people of God now who are journeying through the wilderness. They are the people of the new Exodus who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, who's the ultimate Passover lamb. They are the people of the new covenant who have God's word buried deep inside them, restoring their hearts and renewing their minds. They are the new temple built on the foundation of Jesus himself, and they're the new kingdom of priests who are serving God as his representatives to the nations. Now, by applying all of these amazing images to these persecuted Gentile Christians, Peter is placing their suffering within a brand new story, and this leads into the next section. Their persecution can actually help bring clarity to their mission in the world, to bear witness to God's mercy among the nations. So Peter first encourages them to submit to Roman rule, even if it's oppressive. Yes, he acknowledges, their persecution, their suffering is unjust. But violent resistance solves nothing, not to mention that it betrays the teachings of Jesus who loved his enemies instead of killing them. Peter then specifically highlights the very difficult situation that Christian slaves and wives faced when they lived in Roman households where the patriarch did not follow Jesus. The problem was that it was expected that everyone in the household would submit to and worship the patriarchs, gods. And so Peter's aware that giving allegiance to Jesus will generate suspicion. So Peter says, it's true. All Christians, including Roman wives and slaves, have been fully liberated by Jesus. But they are to demonstrate that freedom, not through rebellion, but by resisting evil the same way Jesus did, through showing love and generosity to your enemies. And in homes where the husband is also a Christian, it's a different story. They are to treat their wives totally different from their Roman neighbors, regarding them as equals before God who are worthy of honor and respect. And Peter's hopeful that this imitation of Jesus' love and upside-down kingdom will give power to their words as they bear witness to God's mercy and show people the beautiful truth about the way of Jesus. But Peter's also a realist. He knows that Christians will continue to be persecuted, and so he reminds them of their future vindication. He recalls how Jesus himself was unfairly persecuted and murdered by corrupt human powers. But in reality, he was dying for the sins of his enemies. And afterward, he was vindicated and given resurrection life by the Spirit. And now Jesus is exalted as king over all human and spiritual powers. Then Peter shows how baptism points to the vindication of Jesus' followers. So like Noah, they've been saved through the waters, not as a magic ritual, but as a sacred symbol that shows their change of heart, their desire to be joined to Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And so now, even if they are murdered for following Jesus, their hope is in future vindication and exaltation alongside their king. Which leads Peter into the final movement. He recalls Jesus' words that his disciples should consider it an honor and joy to be persecuted just like he was. Peter then calls on church leaders to care for these suffering Christians and to show the same kind of servant leadership that Jesus did to his followers. And finally, Peter reminds these Christians about the real enemy that they are facing. This hostility isn't simply cultural or even political. There are dark forces of spiritual evil at work inspiring hatred and violence and they are to resist this evil by staying faithful to Jesus and his teachings and by anticipating his return and ultimate victory over such evil. Peter concludes with a prayer for divine strength, and he sends a greeting from the church in Rome, which he calls Babylon. Now, this is cool. Peter's adopting here the tradition of the Old Testament prophets for whom the name Babylon became an archetype for any and every corrupt nation. And so Rome has become the new Babylon, and its empire is where God's people are now exiled from their true home in the renewed creation. Peter's first letter is a powerful reminder of Christian hope in the midst of suffering. God's people 
have been a misunderstood minority from the very beginning, and they should expect to face hostility because they've chosen to live under the rule of a different king, Jesus. However, persecution can become a strange gift to the church because it offers a chance to show others the surprising generosity and love of Jesus, which is fueled by the hope of his return. And that's what 1 Peter is all about. On September the 2nd, 1666, there was a great fire in London. It began in a baker's oven. You can actually work out the exact location of that baker's oven if you go to what's called the Monument in East London. On the top of the Monument, there are uh, bronze flames coated in gold leaf. And if you could take that monument and lie it down it's the exact distance from where the baker's oven was that originally started the fire. And it caused tremendous damage. 200,000 people lost their homes because most houses were timber framed in those days. Did 10 million pounds of the damage, even in their money. And altogether, 90 churches were destroyed. Many of them rebuilt by Christopher Wren, including St. Paul's Cathedral afterwards. Now, of course, when there's a disaster, it's one of the unfortunate sides of human nature that you look round for a scapegoat, someone to blame. Lockerbie disaster, anyway, people are wanting to find someone who they can blame for it and will search for someone. And often the innocent are accused. And in the case of the Great Fire of London, the French Catholics <coughs> became the scapegoat. And they were blamed for having set London on fire. Now, on July the 19th, in the year 64 AD, the city of Rome burnt down. And again, there was widespread dev devastation. It burned for three days, and then it died down, and then the wind changed and blew it up again, and there was a second great fire, and most of the center of Rome, many temples, many houses were destroyed. The same thing happened. They looked for a scapegoat, only this time, they began to blame the Roman Emperor Nero. They knew he had ambitions to pull down all these buildings and put up new magnificent structures. And so they said, ah, Nero started all this. He got somebody to light the fire. Well, Nero wasn't having any of that, so he looked round for another scapegoat. And this time the Christians got it. And that really marked the outbreak of serious persecution of Christians to the point of martyrdom, and it was triggered off by that great fire of Rome. They were tortured, they were sewn into the skins of wild beasts and made to crawl round the theatres on all fours while they were set upon by lions and other wild animals. They were hunted by dogs, they were crucified. I remember standing with my back to the Colosseum and looking at a low green hill next to the Colosseum in Rome, which is Nero's palace garden. And I thought of the day when he held a barbecue party in that garden and he took the Christians and he coated them with tar and bitumen and then he tied them to posts around the garden and set them on fire while they were still alive to provide fairy lights for his barbecue party. And a shock wave went through the whole empire from church to church when they heard about it. And with that shockwave went a little letter from a man called Peter to get people ready for the shockwave of persecution that he knew would spread. Peter himself was to die in that shockwave. He was to be crucified. As Jesus had predicted, fancy living for 30 years knowing that you'll die by crucifixion. That's not a very pleasant thing to have at the back of your mind. When he came to be crucified in Rome during that Neronic persecution, he requested especially that the cross be inserted in the socket in the rock upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be the same way up as Jesus. And he wrote this little letter we're going to read now or look at now. And he wrote it to the Christians with whom he had a special connection and interest in what we call now Turkey, northwest Turkey. 
He obviously had been ministering in that area. Paul had ministered in southern Turkey, but Peter seems to have gone to northern Turkey. Way in that northern area, he writes to them and he says, get ready, you're going to suffer. And therefore, in a sense, 1 Peter is really for Christians who are suffering. It's relevant everywhere. Christians are fearful and wondering what's going to happen now, as in fact they are in many, many parts of the world. And the surprise is he doesn't tell them how to escape it, but how to endure it. Not how to get out of it, but how to stay in it for Jesus and how to conduct themselves when it comes. How to live in an increasingly hostile world, an increasingly anti-Christian society. Well, it's very relevant for us because persecution has now broken out in this country. It's no bigger than the tip of an iceberg as yet. But if at the next election we swing to the left, it's going to increase. I'm not making that a political statement. In other countries, the anti-Christians are on the right wing of politics. In our country, they happen to be on the left. And I believe we are going to have much greater battles in the future, not least over such things as the Sex Discrimination Act and both the question of homosexuality in the church and the question of male and female elders. It will be under the Race Discrimination Act because it's now considered an offence either to criticise another religion or even to say that your religion is better than any other. And so we are facing an increasing pressure on Christians, so it hasn't reached yet nearly the degree that it was going to reach when Peter wrote this letter. Now the writer, we know a lot about him. Great favourite is Peter and his letter is a favourite letter too. Uh, Christians love to study 1 Peter, it's a warm, human letter that really touches your heart and it really comes across. You know when he speaks in the first chapter to Christians and says, even though you haven't seen Jesus, you love him and you have an unspeakable joy in doing so. Well, that touches your heart. It's, it's a beautiful letter. This impulsive man with foot and mouth disease, as we said earlier, always opening his mouth and putting his foot in it, but that did mean that he did open his mouth from time to time and was the first to say wonderful things about Jesus. What else do we know about him? His first name was Simon or Simeon or Simon, which means a reed. Fancy calling your son a reed, almost like calling him weedy. But Jesus, when he met him, said, I don't like that name. I'm going to give you another name, Rock. And that's something of what happened to this impetuous man. When Jesus found him, he could be easily swayed like a reed in the wind, but when Jesus left him, he was solid rock. I suppose the most moving occasion was after he denied him three times and then met him on the shores of Galilee after the resurrection. And uh, some bishops need to know that Jesus fried fish after his resurrection. <laughs> that was real enough. And Jesus cooked breakfast for the disciples and there was Peter. And suddenly Peter found himself looking into a charcoal fire. Now there are only two charcoal fires in the whole New Testament actually mentioned. One was in the courtyard of the high priest when Peter was warming his hands over the fire and a little girl said, uh, you're a friend of Jesus, aren't you? No, no. But you've got the same dialect from up north. Oh, well, a lot of us have. But I've seen you with him. I swear I don't know the man. And as he said that, Jesus was led through the courtyard. It broke Peter's heart. Now he's looking at a charcoal fire again. It must have brought it all back. And Jesus said, Peter, I rather hoped you'd be the first pastor, but I'm afraid now you'll just have to give out the hymn books. Is that what he said? <laughs> it's the kind of thing we say. No, he said, Peter, I'm going to put you on probation for a year and see if you've pulled your socks up and, and after a year we'll review your case and reconsider your position. Did he say that? No. You know what he said? He said, Peter, I can cope with you, provided I'm sure of one thing. Do you love me? Do you love me? So Peter emphasizes that in his letter. He says, though you haven't seen him as I have, 
yet you love him. That's the most important thing that's going to matter in the future to you. Do you love him? See, Jesus can cope with you as anybody can cope with you, provided they know that you love them. Husbands and wives find out the worst about each other. They can cope with that, provided they can be sure of their heart. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He asked him three times. And somehow that put Peter back on the rock. And dear old Peter, the first to get up and preach, well, I've got ten tapes on the life of Peter, so I'll leave you to go through those tapes because it's one of the most lovely studies you can make, the life of this man who began as a reed and finished as a rock. Mark's gospel is virtually Peter's gospel. Mark got it all from Peter. And that's why in Mark you find out all about Peter's weaknesses. Peter said, be sure and tell them, Mark, that's what I did. I denied him three times. The book of Acts, first half is all about Peter. In fact, we know more about Peter than probably any other of the apostles, maybe with the exception of Paul. Even in Galatians, as I told you, Peter and Paul are having differences, so Peter went on making his mistakes, but he loved his Lord. And that's why he became the first pastor, not the first pope, the first pastor of the church. And incidentally, he was married. Well, Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So now he's far from home, and for 30 years he's lived with the knowledge that he's going to die. And he's in Rome, and this has burst out in Rome. And he writes to those churches that he was personally in touch with in northern Turkey, and he says, get ready. Now, actually, there were people from that area at Pentecost in Acts 2. There were people from that same area. So maybe that's how it all started. And some of the people from that area, listening to Peter's first sermon, responded, got baptized and filled with the Spirit, went back home, and then asked Peter later and said, you know, we came to Christ through you, come and visit us. Maybe that's how it arose, I don't know. But he gives them a Jewish title. And by then they would have included many Gentiles. And yet he, he gives them a Jewish title, this same title, the Dispersion to those of the dispersion. Because you see, that title was another of those that came through from Israel to the church, as did a number of titles in the second chapter of this letter. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Those are titles of Israel from the book of Exodus. And Peter is applying titles of Israel to the church. And just as the Jews are a dispersion, they're all over the world now, so Christians are a dispersion. And we are misfits. He calls them aliens, strangers. Now, that's one of the problems. When you become a Christian, you become a misfit. You know, I can't stand testimonies that go like this. I came to Jesus and all my troubles were over. <laughs> I don't believe them for a start. And uh, they just are so misleading. My testimony is rather simpler. I came to Jesus at 17 and my troubles began. Some years later I got filled with the Spirit and my troubles got much worse. <laughs> and from time to time I'm asked, what is the evidence of being filled with the Spirit? And I always say, I'll tell you in one word, trouble. <laughs> and the reason why you get into trouble is that one of the immediate effects of being filled with the Spirit is that you have a boldness of speech. And that's even more common in acts than tongues. The Greek word is parasia. It means you become bold to speak out. And that's not the way to win friends and influence people. It's the way to lose friends and influence people. And that's what the early disciples did. Holy boldness. You become a misfit. And one of the proofs that you've been born again is that your sense of humor changes. You no longer find certain things funny, but you do find certain new things funny. Sense of humor changes. And you find it increasingly difficult to communicate with the people you knew before. Because you're living in another world now, they don't understand. It becomes particularly excruciatingly difficult when a husband or a wife is converted before their partner. And, and here are two people living in two different worlds and they can't share so much. And God never intended it. That's why a believer is forbidden to marry an unbeliever, because of that tension. 
because there's going to be a whole area that they can't share. And some of the most unhappy homes are the homes of an unequal yoke between husband and wife. You're a misfit, you're a strange. You no longer belong here. You actually belong somewhere else. And though you will spend the rest of your years here in the world, you no longer belong to it. You are actually part of a new species. You're no longer Homo sapiens. You're Homo novus. You're new men. You're no longer in Adam. You're in Christ. There's a new species of human beings on earth. Well now, because you're a misfit, every misfit suffers. You know, we used to have large litters of pigs on the farm, but there was always one called the runt. A little pig that was different from the others, and the way all the others treated them was dreadful. You know? And I'm afraid human society without Christ is a jungle. We are naked apes, except that apes don't behave as badly as human beings do. I can believe that we've descended from them, <laughs> that we're a lower species than the apes, because apes don't do to each other what we do to each other. And children at school are so unkind, so cruel to somebody who's different really is quite a proof of original sin. Therefore, Christians expect trouble. And Jesus was so honest, he said, in the world you'll have big trouble. But he said, cheer up, I'm on top of it. And I said to a friend of mine recently, how are you? And he said, I'm very well over the circumstances. <laughs> and I thought, only a Christian would talk like that. <laughs> he said, Jesus is over the circumstances. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm on top of it. And you're in me. So we're on top of it together. But he always promised us big trouble. And you notice that when Paul went back to the southern Galatian churches, he went back to preach this message to the believers. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God through big trouble. Let's be honest. Let's promise people, come to Jesus and you're in for trouble. But cheer up, he's on top of it. That's the real good news. And we ought to be honest with people. Now, some of you have been asking me where I got that bit about James. Well, I didn't get in the New Testament. There are many other documents in the early church and reliable documents. They've been collected. One of the best known collections is called Documents of the Christian Church or the Early Church. Is it by Henry Bettinson? Uh, and they're very interesting. They're not the Word of God. They don't have apostolic authority, but they give us great insight into the condition of the early church. And there is one from just about the turn of the first century called the Epistle to Diognetus. And it's got a most moving passage in it. It's an appeal, it's a letter defending Christians before the civic authorities, describing what Christians really are, to show that we're not guilty of bad citizenship, we're not disloyal, we're good citizens. But this is the paragraph I was particularly struck with. It's been widely quoted, but it's a beautiful description of how we're in the world but not of it. This is the letter. Christians are not marked out from the rest of mankind by their country, or their speech, or their customs. They dwell in cities both Greek and barbarian, each as his lot is cast, following the customs of the region in clothing and food, and in the outward things of life generally. Yet they manifest the wonderful and openly paradoxical character of their own state. They inhabit the land of their birth, but as temporary residents thereof. They take their share of all responsibilities as citizens, and yet endure all the disabilities of aliens. Every foreign land is their native land, and every native land is their foreign land. They pass their days upon earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Isn't that an amazing description? And so every land is a native land, and missionaries have gone everywhere and just fitted in with the customs and the dress and the speech of the land, and yet it's a foreign land. And even if you stay in the land in which you're born, now you're a foreigner. You belong somewhere else. 
Now that is the situation in which suffering arises. We are different, we are misfits, and as long as there is peace and prosperity, everything's okay, but when things get tight, when crises come, it's the misfits who get it first. And now that, for example, Germany has high unemployment, up to 50% in East, who's getting it? The Turks, the aliens, the other workers from elsewhere, who were welcome when Germany was prosperous and had work for all. But now there's pressure. See? So when there's trouble, Christians can expect to have more than their fair share of it. Because we don't belong, we're different. We're not one of the crowd, we're not one of the club. Now that's the basic theme behind. Suffering is at the heart of this letter. And if you go through the letter underlining the word suffering, you will realize that is what it's all about. But he has two other themes. One is salvation, and he reminds them of the salvation which is the foundation of their attitude to suffering. And then the practical side of his letter is how to deal with suffering. And the most amazing advice is learn to submit to it. Don't fight it. Don't try and get your own back. Accept it. Now that's unusual advice. And he applies that word submission in a number of areas. It is not blind submission, as we shall see, but it is learning to have a submissive spirit. One of the things that astonished the world was when the Jews were being carted off to extermination camps, how quietly they walked into the cremation chambers, how submissive they were. It was an astonishing fact because they knew what was going to happen to them. And what Peter is saying, that must be your attitude. Now, of course, that's absolutely against all human instinct, isn't it? That's the very opposite of how we normally respond to injustice. Because normally, when a thing is unfair, we say so. It's one of the earliest things children learn to say. It's not fair. <laughs> and their face screws up when they say it. And you see that same expression on picket lines, don't you, outside a factory on strike. You see that same injustice. And the response of the flesh to injustice and wrong suffering is that. It's the clenched fist to stand up for your rights. And yet what Peter is saying is in the kingdom you have no rights. And Christians need to prepare for suffering by learning to give in, to accept it. Now, it's amazing advice. And all your instincts say that's not what we should do. We should fight it and try and prevent it and stop it. It's unjust. We shouldn't suffer for this because we're innocent. But all the time, Peter says that's the wrong attitude. And he perfectly exemplified it when he came to be crucified himself didn't fight it. He said, just upside down, please. And he lived up to what he actually said. Now let's just run through the letter and get the feel of it. It all hinges around these three. He does move from salvation to suffering to submission, but the three are a bit more interlocked than that. They are three themes that go all the way through. But in the first two chapters, he is concentrating on salvation even though he warns them that it's to get them ready for suffering. First thing we need to be absolutely sure of when the going gets tough is we need to be sure of our salvation. If you're not sure about that, boy, you're going to be in trouble because that's the firm foundation. And so he says there are two aspects to your salvation you must be absolutely sure about now. First, the individual aspect, and second, the corporate aspect. Now, both are part of being saved. We're saved as individuals, but we've been saved into a family. And that family is going to stand you in good stead when the pressure's on. You won't be able to cope by yourself. You need to be part of a fellowship that's going to stay together. But the individual side comes through the Word of God. And it was the through the Word of God, he says, that you were born again. The Word of God that will never pass away. It was through the Word that you found your salvation. 
And that gave you three things. Now, I'm sure you know at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, now abide is faith, hope, and love. But that trinity of Christian virtues goes all the way through Scripture. They all use it. Faith is primarily relating you to what God has done in the past. Hope relates you to what he's going to do in the future. And love relates you to what he's doing in the present. But faith, hope, and love are the three dimensions of your individual salvation. The trouble is today, faith, hope, and love abide, but of these, the most neglected is hope. And that's a tragedy. And I'm, that's why I made the video, The Final Facts, because I find as I move around the country, the future is not being talked about. It's all the kingdom now. It's all here and now. It's all how to live in the kingdom now, how to have your marriage in the kingdom now, and your business in the kingdom now. And so there's been very little talk about heaven and hell and the return of Christ and the Day of Judgment in many new fellowships. So we made that video to try and restore this dimension of hope because hope is an anchor. That's the symbol of hope. It's an anchor that holds you when the storm comes, when you know how it's all going to end. That holds you firm when you're in crisis, when the storm hits you, if your anchor's down and your hope is sure and you know that Jesus is coming back for us you can face anything. But we've been so concentrating on faith and love that we haven't been teaching people how to hope. And 1 Peter is the epistle of hope. He concentrates on hope in both his letters more than faith and love. But what he says is, God has given you a living hope by the resurrection from the dead. Even if they kill you, death won't touch you. You've got a living hope for the future and the hope of a new body and a new life beyond the grave. You can face death if you know that. A friend of mine was held up by a mugger in Sydney, Australia with a knife. And the man was going to plunge the knife into his chest if he didn't give him all his money. And my friend just said, you can't frighten me. I said, why not? He said, because if you stick that knife in me, you just rush me to heaven and I'm longing to go there. And he really meant it. And the mugger dropped the knife and he led him to the Lord. What an instinctive reaction. But you see, his hope was so certain. Another man I know, a Methodist headmaster, a burglar broke into his house and held him up at gunpoint in his study across the desk. And that friend just said, whatever brought you to this, my friend? His whole concern was for the man. And again, he led the man to the Lord. See, when your hope is sure, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? When your hope is sure, even death doesn't. They just rush you into the presence of the Lord. Mind you, to balance up, I must tell you about Herbert Silverwood. Any of you heard that name? He was a pub comedian who became a, an evangelist. And he used to go to Yarmouth. And on the promenade, he used to preach on the front. You knew him too? And one day they persuaded him to go in swimming in the water, and he hated swimming, but he donned an old pair of Bermuda shorts or some really outlandish garment, and they took him in. He couldn't swim, but the sea shelved rather steeply, and they hadn't realized that. And he got out of his depth, and he's splashing around and yelling for help, and the lifeguard pulled him out and pumped him dry. The lifeguard said, Mr. Silverwood, I don't understand you. I've heard you preaching about heaven all this week and how much you long to go there. First chance you get to go... <laughs> He said, you're yelling for me to pull you back again. <laughs> now, Herbert Silverwood hadn't been a pub comedian for nothing. And he just looked down. He said, would you go like this? <laughs> but uh, knowing, knowing Herbert Silverwood, he really did long to go. Do you know the real difference between a Christian who's got hope for the future and one who hasn't? A Christian who hasn't is willing to depart and be with Christ, but wanting to stay here. But a Christian with real hope wants to go, but is willing to stay. See? Now remember the last letter I wrote to David Watson. I just shared that with him. And it made quite a difference to him. He mentions it in his little autobiography, Fear No Evil. And it was, da David, are you willing to go but wanting to stay, or wanting to stay, wanting to go but willing to stay. And Paul said, 
I'm wanting to depart, but if he wants me to stay around here a bit longer, I'm willing to stay. Quite a difference, isn't it? That's why that man in Beaconsfield said, come and see how a Christian dies. Eager for off. Well, that's hope. And he's begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He's also given us a tested faith. And he said, don't worry, your faith is like gold to you. But gold is always refined by testing. The fire's tested. And it comes out more pure. And you know, in the old days when they purified gold, they had a big vat. And the man would keep stirring it over the fire until he could see his own face perfectly in it. And then he stopped refining it. And your faith will go through that. Be tested. And we've got a joyful love. Even though we've not seen him, we love him and we're filled with a joy unspeakable. Now, a person who's got that has got half salvation. There's another half too. That's the corporate half, that we're part of a people of God. Through the Word of God, we find individual salvation for ourselves, but that also introduces us to the people of God. And the people of God are very important to Peter. And he lays this foundation before he talks about the suffering. He said, you've got to get these two things right. You've got to have these, this faith, hope, and love yourself. And you need to be part of the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people of God. He said, you're a living temple. He said, Christ is the cornerstone and you are living stones. And you are the temple of God. You need to remember that, that together as Christians, we are God's dwelling place on earth, his holy temple. And people touching us are touching God's holy temple. And we are a royal priesthood. We're all priests. I remember giving a lecture on the priesthood of all believers at a seminar in Zurich in Switzerland. And a man came to me afterwards um, and he said, uh, oh, that was wonderful. He said, I've never heard such thing before. I said, oh, what's your background? He said, uh, no, I said, uh, it w there were many Catholics there. I said, are you a priest? He said, no, I'm a, I'm a Catholic layman. I said, are you a priest? No, he said, I told you, I'm a Catholic layman. I said, are you a priest? He said, no, no, I said, I'm a Catholic layman. I said, are you a priest? And he began to blush. He began to be embarrassed. He thought I was either crazy or deaf or something. <laughs> and I asked him five times, and then suddenly he laughed. He said, yes, I am. I said, now I believe you heard me. Because, no, people thank you for the sermon. They may not have heard it or received it. And I said, now, whenever anybody asks you, are you a priest, what would you say? He said, I am. I thought, that man's got it. He's part of the royal priesthood now. And bear in mind that towards those who persecute you, you are a priest. You're the one who can go to God on their behalf and bring a word from God to them. You are their priest, even though they're throwing stones at you or calling your names. You are their priest, the only priest between them and God they may ever have. And we are a holy nation. We're special. And it holds you when people ridicule you and say, oh, well, you're only a minority. You're a special people, a holy nation. Now, that's the foundation he lays. Now he says you're ready to face suffering if you've got that. But get the foundation right. Be absolutely sure you've got the individual side of foundation, the faith, the hope, and the love, and the corporate side that you belong to this people and know you do, that you're a living stone and a priest, and you're part of a new holy nation that God is calling out from the earth. Then you're ready to face the suffering. He says three things about it. Number one, don't ever deserve it. Now, if you go to prison for crime, don't think you're suffering for Jesus. Very important point. Often, you know, we, we offend people with our manner or with our awkwardness, and then we say, of course, it's the offense of the gospel. It's nothing of the kind. Make sure that the only offense is the offense of the gospel. Make sure that if you go to prison, it's not because of something wrong you've done. It's a shame when Christians suffer for doing wrong things. He said, suffer for doing right, not wrong. It should never be deserved. That's an important point. Then he said, the second thing when you suffer, it should never be revenged. Don't ever retaliate. Now the instinct is to hit back. 
As someone told me when he read the Sermon on the Mount, he said, it says, turn the other cheek. He said, I would turn the other cheek and I'd bring the right knee up sharply. <laughs> that is the instinct of us, isn't it? When someone insults you, well, I just won't talk to them again. When somebody hurts you, well, I'll just wait a chance to do something back. That's instinct. Revenge is instinctive, to hit back. He says, don't ever do that. Jesus, when he suffered, did not retaliate. When they spat on him, I remember talking to some church member who had been mortally offended by another church member over something. You know, it, it always happens. And uh, this person was saying, and they did this and they said that and the other. And I said, did they spit on you? I should hope not. <laughs> See? I said, they spat on Jesus. And there was saliva running down his face. And they unnecessarily caused him to suffer. You know, when a lamb was slain in the Old Testament, it was not tortured beforehand. Its throat was cut clean and quick. But when the Lamb of God was slain, they mocked him, they jammed the thorns on his forehead, they dressed him up, they spat on him. What was his response? Father, forgive them. They don't realize. Now says Peter, don't ever think of how you can get your own back. Repay evil with good. Give them good, not evil. Bless them, he says. Bless them. That's exactly what Jesus said. Bless those who curse you. That's the best way to get your own back. It heaps coals of fire on their head. Bless those who curse you. There was a young man went into the army and the first night he knelt down by his bunk in the barrack room and said his prayers. And the sergeant was right opposite in a bed and he saw this man and he threw his boot at the man and it cut his ear. And a boot's a heavy thing. And the nails in the boot cut the man's ear. And he went on praying. So the sergeant threw the other boot at him and that caught him and cut him. And, uh, but he went on praying, so the sergeant gave up. Next morning, those boots were at the foot of the sergeant's bed, polished. You know? The sergeant said, I've got to find out what makes a guy do that. Well, that's Peter. He says, don't revenge. And thirdly and finally, don't let it get you. They're trying to weigh you down. Don't let it be successful. It may harm your body, but it can't touch your spirit. And body and spirit are key words at that point. What happens to your body doesn't really matter. It's what happens to your spirit that matters. Don't let them get through to your spirit. Let them do what they like with your body, but keep your spirit intact. Well, time has gone, so we'll move into the third part in the second talk. <laughs>